if, on the other hand, I take a presence and I predict it as absence, that's a false negative or an omission error. If I take an absence and predict it as presence, that is a false positive or a commission. Okay? So again, we're going to use this two by two matrix for essentially everything. So make sure you understand it. Raise your hand if you have any doubts about it at this point. Uh, one thing that I want to point out is this right here. Remember we talked about how much we believe in presence data and how much we're unsure of absence data. Okay? So it says assume. I'm going to give you a couple reasons why you should worry about absence data. Remember the band diagram. There are absences in the band diagram that are meaningful. Okay, those are the ones that are outside of A, right? We're trying to estimate A, which is the area that fits the fundamental niche. And so the meaningful absences are the ones that are inside of M, they're accessible to the species, but they're outside of A. But there are a lot of other absences. There are all of those absences that are outside of M. So we have to be very, very careful because those absence data may be very difficult to judge as to whether they're usable or not. And so what you're going to see is some degree of essentially backing off of use and belief in absence data. And so the very best test that we can use will be things that prioritize presence because we believe those more. Just remember that. But be thinking all the way through about this, about this confusion that you have. Any questions about that? May I use published records, present data, to test my model or published records are fine. So long as they are in effect the records that place a species at a particular place at a particular time, right? So if you have published records that are dots on maps or that are lists of localities, yeah. you can use them to model calibration. Like in that study I showed you of 80,000 pictures, okay? Or you can use them for model testing. You can, you can do creative things like um, relate your predictions to it is area-based publication information, like the maps. You can ask how much, how well your model predictions correspond to uh, published map. Okay? It's not going to be as straightforward or as quantitative as the ideas that we'll show you this morning, but yeah, of course you can. Anybody tell me how this should relate to omission error? 
commission error is leaving out those presences. So give me the formula for omission error. Say it again. There we go. One minus this this fraction gives us omission error. Okay? What I'm after is that it all comes back to A, B, C, D. Okay? But we're going to use this, num this number for quite a few things. Uh, Enrique told you about best subsets in GARP. And remember that was based on 1 minus A over A plus C. Uh, so we can we can use these approaches in a very simple binomial testing approach. The, the example I like to give is imagine there's a target over there on the wall. Okay? And I'm throwing darts at it. Right? And if I'm a very good dart player, I'm going to hit that target. Right? And if I'm a very bad dart player, if I'm blindfolded, I'm either going to hit an Enrique or I'm going to miss the target. So you can imagine essentially rating the quality of the dart player, right? how skilled is he, by how many times he hits the target. Well, if the target is this big and it's over there on that wall, it's going to be very difficult to hit. But if the target is very large and occupies most of the wall, then it's going to be very easy to hit. Okay? That's essentially the, the point we're making here. Look at the dots. Those are the darts. Okay? And look at the gray area. That's the target. And so the question is, with these in independent points, how frequently are they hitting the target? And so here for this species, you can see a bunch of points are indeed within the gray area, and then we have these looks like two model failures. There must be a third failure in there somewhere, but, uh, oh, I see, I see. The, reds, the red ones are probably uh, presences and, or, or testing, and the gray are training. Sorry, now I understand. Let's start over. This map of Madagascar has a prediction on it, which is in gray. The model, I believe, was calibrated using the gray stars and then tested using the red stars. And what you can see is that they had seven testing points. And of those, four of them were correctly predicted. One, two, and there's probably a third might fall in a, in a white pixel. Um, so essentially, you, you're getting uh, four out of seven success, but then only 23% of the map is covered by gray. It's predicted as suitable. And so we're asking, what is the probability of four successes out of seven trials when the underlying probability is 0.23? And the answer is, well, that probability is 0.05. So it's not quite statistically significant, but you can see there's a pretty serious tendency to get the, the right answer, okay? Uh, this is just like the idea of coin tosses, okay? There, the underlying probability is 0.5, and so if I get you know, six out of 10, I'm not terribly impressed, but if I get 10 out of 10, I fairly impressed. Uh, here's a different example, different species, or actually it looks like a different model, and trained with a different set of those same points and tested with the red points, and it looks like the success rate was six out of seven. Here the model was a bit broader, it's 34% instead of 23%, but the success rate was better and so we, we see a binomial probability of getting six out of seven correct with an underlying probability of 34%, and that probability is now very statistically significant. 
Okay? So this is a very, very simple model evaluation approach. And it's quite excellent. Okay? You can do it very easily. The only thing that you need to do is that threshold step. Okay? So after you've produced your models, which you guys have done, there's that reclassification step where you say, okay, everything below this value is absent and everything above this value is present. And actually yesterday afternoon, Richard worked out in QGIS how to do that reclassification step and we put it on the guide. So you have a guide to how to do it. Okay. So this is what we call the binomial test. Very simple, very straightforward. I'll only give you one little caution about it. Let's imagine that we have a coin that's slightly imbalanced, right? Has a little bit more mass on one side than on the other. If I flip that coin seven times, we get three or four successes out of seven. Right? What if I flip that coin a million times? I'm going to start getting that bias manifest. And it might even be statistically significant. But my success rate, even though it's statistically significant, my success rate might be 550,000 out of one million. Might be statistically significant just because the numbers are so big. And yet, for the purposes that you want to use your model for, that may not be enough. 55% or 52% correct classification might not be enough. So many times when you build and test models, you need to ask two questions. Statistical significance, am I doing better than them? And second, is the performance sufficient that it's acceptable to me? And so that can take us back to uh, these things like omission rates and sensitivity. Okay? You can say, I don't want to leave out more than 5%. Okay, so I need my omission rate to be low. So it's the idea of testing significance and also measuring performance. Okay, then uh, Richard sets us up for another use that we're going to make uh, out of uh, confusion matrices. You've seen this one. It's the proportion of obser observed presences correctly predicted and it's A over A plus C. That's also called sensitivity. Sorry for the three sets of terminology. Okay? We can calculate essentially a, a corresponding statistic, which is the proportion of observed absences correctly predicted. So here, how much of this column is in the correct prediction category? That's called specificity. And D over B, that's a plus D. So D over B plus D. So the reason why we show you those two statistics is that we're going to use those when we shift to threshold independent approaches. Okay? So this is a, an example. We'll put it in the packet for you. Um, this is an example of this sort of uh, work. Okay, so that's kind of the simple part of model evaluation. Whenever you get worried about it, whenever it doesn't make sense, just think of, and let's do it. See the whiteboard over there, and see the wall. Let's say the whiteboard covers 20% of that wall. And I'm gonna stand over here, and I'm going to throw darts at that white board. Okay? And if I'm good, they're all going to hit. And so I throw 10 out of 10 darts, and they all hit. I throw 10 darts, and they all hit the white board. I'm pretty good. What's the probability of getting 
10 successes and 10 trials given an underlying probability of 0.2. Okay? But if I take off my glasses and maybe I'm blindfolded, I'm pretty much blind without the glasses, maybe I hit the whiteboard only two times out of 10. And that's where I'm next expectation. So essentially what you're doing is you're asking whether your testing points, your independent testing subset, is coinciding with your prediction better than, more, more than you would observe if you plotted a huge number of random points. That's, the, that's essentially the binomial test. Does that make sense to everybody? It's also important to mention here that uh, this, this simply uh, measurements of, of, of uh, performance of the models are, are affected by, by the selection of M. The bigger the wall is, the smaller the, the, the white wall would look. So is the, the statistics behind are going to be affected. So it's, that, that's why it's very important to have a good reason for selecting the size of M. That's, that's what 